All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Drainage and Donuts webinar. We're gonna get started in just a second. This webinar series is funded through the Northeast Extension Risk Management and Education Program. Our goals for the webinar are for everyone to learn about best management practices on tile uh, drained fields learn how farmland with subsurface tile drainage may affect water quality, learn about end of tile treatments, and to overall increase your knowledge about the required agricultural practices um, and uh, new agricultural practices that will be going into place to manage subsurface tile drainage. As, as folks know, we have a great lineup of speakers from all over the country that will be talking about the research and experiences that they have um, with tile drainage. So today is the first webinar um, on Friday. Mark Ruark from the University of Wisconsin will be joining us talking about the work that they have done um, with farmers and tile drainage management in Wisconsin. Next Wednesday, um, Eric Young, who many of you know, used to be at Minor Institute, now at the USDA um, Ag Research Service in Marshfield, Wisconsin, will be joining us talking about his research um, at Minor Institute and also tile, um, end of tile treatment. On Friday, November 2nd, Lindsay Pease, who is now at the University of Minnesota, but was at, um, at Ohio State, will be talking about her work with um, Kevin King, who many people know, <laughs> on tile drainage um, and management in Ohio. We'll end our webinar series on Thursday, November 8th. Um, and myself, Heather Darby from the University of Vermont, will be presenting to you the results of our tile drainage survey that we conducted last winter and talking about <clears throat> the results from our tile drainage monitoring program. I'll be joined by Ryan Patch from the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, and he'll be providing us with an update on the required agricultural practices and tile drain um, um, or tile drainage amendments. All right, so for those attending the webinar, you can receive one CCA credit per webinar. And you can also receive one water quality education credit for those folks in Vermont per webinar. Um, <clears throat> to request those credits once the webinar is finished, please email susan.brulette at uvm.edu um, and she'll be able to um, record that you attended the webinar and provide you provide that information to the folks that will give out the credits. And we'll follow up with that at the end of the webinar. Um, real quick, the other option with the credits is when you do the online registration, if you provide the information there, you don't have to send me the email because I do receive it there too. Okay. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> now, one last thing. This is called drainage and donuts. So as a uh, incentive to attend all of the webinars, um, if you attend all the webinars, we will provide you with a coupon to Dunkin' Donuts to go have a donut on us or a coffee or whatever uh, you enjoy at Dunkin' Donuts. I just had one of those crazy little spider donuts that you can get for the holiday season. So <clears throat> again, if you attend all the, the webinars, we'll send you a Dunkin' Donuts coupon. All right, so we're gonna get started with the webinar. Um, please, if you have questions, you can type them, simply type them in the chat box um, or um, in the Q&A box. And Josh will try to answer those as he's presenting. And those that he doesn't get to will um, take some time at the end of the webinar to do Q&A. Now, can you maximize your, oh. there we go. Got it. Okay. We do have it. All right. Welcome, Joshua. We'll let All right. You let you take it from here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Heather. All right, so good to be with you. So like Heather said, um, Josh Faulkner, I'm an ag engineer, work with UVM Extension, been here about five and a half years or so, um, and work on climate change issues, but 
for me as a as an ag engineer a lot of that is is really about water management um whether it's too much water or too little water um and today we're definitely going to um get into the too much water um category and this is uh i'm going to try to um make this pretty broad um so for those who are unfamiliar with drainage um, i think this will give you um, a good uh, kind of ag drainage 101, um, but then maybe a little bit more information for those who um, already have drainage and some details and some explanation on why we do drainage the way we do drainage. Um, so let's jump right in. So, okay. So when Heather said drainage and donuts, this was, um, of course, where my mind went immediately that um, I could just see donuts falling from the sky and we'll need but we're gonna need bigger tile lines for if we're gonna drain donuts. So anyway, I can't see you. Hopefully that got a couple of chuckles to, to kick us off here. So outline of what I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about um, why now. So, so why are we talking about drainage now? Why is there so much interest in drainage installation and drainage investment at this point in time? Um, and I think uh, that, that relates directly to a lot of the work I do with, with, with climate change. And then talk about some of the benefits of drainage. This is really the, I really have the fun um, part of this webinar series where I get to talk about how drainage works um, and some of the benefits it can provide to farmers where um, of course we know there are some environmental concerns but those will be addressed later on in the remaining webinar series. But I just wanna make sure we're all starting from the same page um, and understanding um, um, tile drainage. I'll go through uh, some Ag Drainage 101, um, I'll talk about different types of drainage um, and then but mainly focus on tile drainage. Talk about installation, some of the details around um, how tile gets installed, considerations when tile is installed, so on and so forth. Um, talk about some of the economic considerations, I'm not an economist but um, I think some of the economics of drainage are pretty straightforward so want to present some of that and then briefly just mention some of the regulatory and environmental issues and really, like I said, set the stage for the later um, webinar presenters. So why now? So if we look at um, what's been happening over the past 100 years or so in the Northeast, it is, it is definitely getting, getting wetter. Um, in the Northeast as a whole, we've seen an increase of about four inches um, in, in our annual average precipitation over that 100 year period. Four inches over 100 years is really not, not such a big deal. But when you drill down into the data and look at some of the climate district specific data for Vermont, um, you see a very different picture, especially uh, when, you, when you look at the past 30 years. Um, and in that past 30 year time window, for example, in the Northeast Kingdom, we've seen an increase of about nine inches on an annual basis of rainfall. Um, in the Champlain Valley, an increase of about seven inches on an annual basis. And then the, the southern um, part of Vermont is a little, not getting as wet or wetter um, as quickly as we are. And they've seen an increase of about five inches on an annual basis. So four inches over 100 years, not such a big deal but nine inches over 30 years. This, I think, is, is anecdotally what is driving a lot of the interest in, in um, tile drainage, this changing climate. This is, this is really, I think, um, um, documented in some of the crop insurance data that is out there. This is USDA Risk Management Agency data from 2012, just showing um, where crop failure, why crop failure occurs in Vermont, and um, this correlates directly with the crop, amount of crop insurance payments that were made. And it's, it's clear to see that the biggest piece of this pie, over half of this pie, is, is excess moisture. Um, this is the first decade of the two, 2001 to 2010, um, so I think this is really good support for some of the data that I just showed that, that, that shows how much wetter we, we are getting and, and the problems that go along with that for, for farmers. What's interesting, I think, is that if you, if you take this same pie 
for states to the west of us and the south of us. As soon as you move out of New England and a little bit out of the northeast, this, this looks very different. That drought piece of the pie gets much, much bigger. Um, um, and, and this excess moisture is, is not near of an issue as it is here in, here in Vermont. But this is, this is certainly um, our challenge with, with climate change. And interest in tile drainage has increased for other reasons as well. This is um, a, a piece I pulled from a, a Minnesota newspaper a few years ago. Um, and this just shows one little watershed in west central Minnesota, how much um, tile drainage was going in um, on an annual basis. You know, this is almost 1,600 miles just in one year in 2011. And, you know, this is, I think part of this is due to a changing climate, but I also think, uh, you know, corn prices were very different back then and, and farmers were, were very uh, um, aggressive with, um, you know, trying to produce as much as, as, much as possible. But, but we're not the only place where, where um, interest and investment in, in tile has increased recently. So let's talk about the benefits of, of tile drainage. And, and it's really, there's, there's two big ones. Um, and the first one is, is pretty intuitive, that we're going to improve crop production because we have drier soils, we're removing water from the, the root zone. Um, less year-to-year -year variability, so we're trying to hop off that roller coaster and hop on the merry-go-round, trying to keep things a little more stable. Um, there are, I can't um, locate data from Vermont, but there are some data from places not too far away um, that, that show this, this benefit from in, in yield improvement from drainage. The first uh, figure here in the center of your screen is from Ontario. And this is a number of different crops, uh, red wheat, corn, wheat, white beans, and soybeans. Um, and looking at tiled, just tiled versus untiled land. And we're seeing yield increases from, you know, 20 some percent up to over 40%. Um, in bushels per acre, so so that documented um, documented improvements in, in yield, and then some work in Ohio. This is a really interesting study, probably the longest running um, drainage study that I'm I'm aware of, um, where they saw a 30% yield increase in corn and soybeans um, over 25 years in, in Ohio. So 30% yield increases is definitely um, um, definitely motivates people to to drain um, and, and install install drainage. It also, this is maybe the unsung reason um, that, that some are aware of and some are not. The second big reason for tile drainage is that it allows earlier and later field operations. So this is really about trafficability, um, just allowing you to get into the field to do what you need to do when you need to do it. Um, so into the field earlier in the spring, able to stay into it a little later into the fall and then any of the intermediate operations, um, you're able to get on the ground and, and avoid um, sinking tractors and, and massive ruts. So here is some data from not too far away. So this is, uh, I have a few slides in here that I borrowed from Larry Gehring, who was the, who was and is currently still the, I, I don't think he's retired yet the drainage extension specialist with Cornell um, in New York State. And this is looking at dry matter yield of, of a few forage species and comparing uh, no drainage to surface drainage to 100 foot spacings to 50 foot spacing. So we look at this 100 foot spacing and 50 foot spacing. And if you're familiar with what's being installed right now, this is really wide spacing. But even at this wide spacing, um, Larry, uh, on a four-year period, saw significant improvements in, in yield um, with drainage versus the no drainage and, and versus a surface drainage situation. So um, this is about as local a data as I could find. So I think, you know, before we get into, um, well, I, let me say a question that always comes up for those unfamiliar with drainage is, is you know I don't want to take water away from my crops because and this also relates to climate change because we're seeing more and more summers where we have droughty periods, um, and I think to help explain why that is not necessarily a concern, um, we have to talk about what water it is that drainage takes out of the soil. So really, when we talk about soil water, there are different 
different buckets, so to speak, of, of soil water. And the water that drainage takes out is what we call, quote unquote, free water. Um, and it's, so it's water that drains freely with gravity. And, and the best way to explain this, I think, is with a demonstration with a sponge. So if you take a sponge and you soak it into a tub, dip it into a tub, tub of water and let it absorb a lot and then pull it out, the water that drains from that sponge as you're just holding it, not squeezing it, that's free water. So if you imagine that soil, that sponge, the, the sponge as a soil, that free water that you're not squeezing the soil is what the tile drainage is going to take out. And that free water is not available to crops. The water that's available to crops is when you squeeze that sponge, when you wring it out and start to force water out of the sponge, that's the, the plant available water. So all that to say that drainage has a benefit in wet years and in dry years. So if we take the, the two corn plants here on the left, so this is undrained land. Um, during the springtime, during a wet springtime, we, we certainly see plenty of those. Um, if you have a high water table on undrained land, the roots of the, of the crops don't penetrate down into that water table. Of course, they're not going to grow down into saturated soil. So that later on in the summer when we have a droughty period, the roots of, that, of, those, of those crops are very shallow and are not down deep where they can access some of that deeper water that they need during the drought periods when it's not raining. On the other hand, the two corn plants on the right hand side of the screen are on tile drain land. And so during the springtime when we have a wet spring, um, we're, we're, the water table is never that high to limit root um, growth. So we have roots growing deep. And so that later on in the summertime when it does get dry, our roots are deep enough to access the capillary fringe of that, of that water table down where the tile lines are. And so the, cap so the capillary fringe is, we have that free water table, which is if you dug a hole and, and water filled up to a certain surface, that would be your water table. But then above that, especially in clay soils and, and finer textured soils, we have water being wicked up by the, by the soil. And so plants can access that, that capillary rise, that, that water that's being um, moved upward by the soil itself above the water table. Tile drainage also, I think, goes a long way toward reducing compaction, which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of nuts about compaction and, and um, I think it's in, really fascinating, but, you know, a well-drained soil is less susceptible to compaction and especially some of the deeper compaction that we see um, in our clay soils. And this is a, this is a figure, this is kind of a, a classic ag engineering figure. Um, that shows um, soil pressure exerted on soils um, below a tractor tire, given a, a dry soil, moist soil, and a wet soil. And you can see that the wetter the soil is, the deeper that um, compressive force travels downward into the soil profile, um, meaning that there's a greater likelihood of resulting in um, not, the sh not necessarily the shallow compaction, which we can address, but that deep compaction, which is, which is tough to fix. Um, it doesn't necessarily fix itself. They found compaction underneath the wagon ruts of the westward migration of when we started to expand westward from well over 100, 150 years ago um, that has been growing plants but is not remediating itself. So I think it's, it's really important to try to avoid this deep compaction if possible. And a well-drained soil helps, helps prevent that. So drainage, there's a lot of interest right now in, in Vermont and over the past few years and, and a lot of concerns and, and valid. Um, all of this is, is valid, but I think it's good to put it in perspective that drainage is actually not something new um, in, in Vermont. And I found this quote from the um, annual report of the Vermont Ag Experiment Station from 1912. Um, and this, this really cool cyclone ditcher um, that was that was taking a picture of this in, in St. Albans. Um, but the quote here is, you know, the question then is not whether one can afford to drain, but whether one can afford not to drain. So even in 1912, um, we were we were concerned about drainage and we saw the benefit of, of drainage. First drainage in the US was was installed in about 19 or I'm sorry, 1820. 
in upstate New York um, by a Scotch um, American, and, and I'll talk. I'll, I have a slide on that at the end, but but it it, it moved fairly quickly um, across the North Country um, and moved into into Vermont as well. And so back then, the uh, uh, tile drainage was about fifty seven dollars um, an acre for thirty foot spacing. Which if you're if you're familiar with what prices are right now, that's um, that's quite a difference. So I'm going to get it, jump right into Ag Drainage 101, and I'm going to start with surface drainage, uh, which I think this is this is really important to kind of like just cover a few of the other types of drainage before we get into tile drainage, because I think these other types of drainage can be good options, um, and in some cases can be the right way to go or more cost effective than necessarily tiling land. This is not the tile is not the only way to drain drain farmland. Um, so surface drainage um, can be very effective, especially on our finer textured soils, on um, very flat soils where we get a lot of ponded water um, and from water originating on site. So what I mean by that is precipitate rainfall falling onto the soil and the soil is so flat um, that the water has nowhere to go. It's not running off. Um, that can be addressed a number of different ways from land leveling, which seems a little bit extreme, but certainly happens, um, to ditching, to surface ditching. So um, um, ditching can, can certainly be effective and, and, and um, less costly in, in some situations for, for surface drainage approaches and surface drainage needs. Then there are, <clears throat> excuse me, interceptor ditches. And these are, um, I think, um, very appropriate ways of cost of, and very cost effective ways of preventing high water table issues, especially in some of the hill farms, the, the more sloping um, fields um, in some of the more hilly terrain in Vermont. And really the idea with interceptor drains is to, is to cut off off-site water that's coming onto our field and causing a problem when it gets onto the field. So these are called interceptors because they're often placed at the toe of an adjacent field or an adjacent forested hillside. Um, and they can be, if you look at the top left image here, um, they can be very um, gentle swells or berms um, placed at the toe of that slope to direct water um, running off the adjacent hillside um, at, uh, away from the field. Um, they can also be ditches, um, and this is the lower left image, is, is one of these ditches, and I've tried to show the water table is the green line before drainage, um, and the blue line is the water table after drainage. So a ditch at the toe of a slope um, captures not just the surface water that runs off of that hillside, um, but also captures the subsurface water um, that's running down that, that um, in, under the underneath the ground on that hillside and capturing it in that ditch to the depth of the of the ditch. So very effective um, for cutting water off in those situations where that's occurring. Uh, you can also do this if you look at the image on the right. Um, you can do this with a with a tile line placed under the ground um, that will cut off um, the subsurface water. The issue with these tile lines, um, with doing it this way, is that you do capture the subsurface water, um, but like the ditch, un unlike the ditch, you don't capture the surface water. So a couple, um, I think very cost effective, a um, few cost effective approaches for some farms and some fields rather than going um, with full on tile drainage. So um, tile drainage, uh, subsurface drainage, also known as open drains, but or there can be open drains, ditches that are designed for subsurface water, not necessarily for surface water. But primarily when we talk about subsurface drainage, we're talking about tile lines. Um, we call them tile because they used to be actually made of, of clay, of, of clay tile. Um, they're not anymore. They're all um, corrugated, uh, black plastic, corrugated, perforated pipe, flexible pipe. Um, but the original was round or a horseshoe. Some of the very first was horseshoe shaped um, tile. And it's, it's the, the very first um, tile that was made in this horseshoe shape was actually shaped on the shin bone of a, of a human being. And they would take clay and wrap it around the shin bone 
and pull it off and then bake it and harden it and um, put it into a trench upside down there, um, you know, with an open, open area facing downwards and it would capture water and move it off site. And some of these, this tile has function, um, functions for a hundred years or more. Um, some does not, but some of it is still out there in the landscape working, working very well. Different configurations of, of tile of, of, and approaches to, to tiling land. Um, here are four, kind of the four big ones. Um, uh, images are in the schematics here on the left. So at the top left um, is a parallel system. This is most common. And you can kind of see an aerial image there on the, on the right of a, of a parallel system. And this is just uh, composed of multiple field drains or um, laterals that all lead to a main um, or a collector drain. Um, the field laterals are typically four inches, sometimes they're three inches, um, but then the main is sized based upon the size of the field and the drainage coefficient. Um, there are herringbone systems. The only difference here is that the main drain um, runs through the middle of the laterals, so you have laterals coming in from the left and the right on that main, on that herringbone system. And then in the lower left corner, there can be a double main where you have um, uh, laterals from both sides of an open ditch um, or a, a low depression in the field um, or the laterals even just emptying, emptying out into a ditch with no main necessarily there. Um, and then random, which um, certainly, you know, this is what we did for, for a long, long time. Um, just trying to target some of the depressional areas and the problem areas within a field um, with, with erratic um, kind of short um, um, pieces of tile or very small kind of compact patterns within a, within a problem area, within a field. So um, if you're interested in, in putting in subsurface drainage, how do you, how do you get started? Um, first of all, I think it's really important to understand where the excess water is coming from. Um, so that you can first um, address your drainage issue with uh, potentially a, a, a less costly alternative like an interceptor ditch, an interceptor drain, or some sort of surface drain. Um, if it's coming from deep compaction, certainly we have fields where there is uh, deeper compaction um, that restricts water movement downward and water can actually perch on that deep compaction, especially in localized areas. Sometimes this happens in, in depressions and maybe that compaction can be addressed instead of just putting in, um, spending the money for, for um, subsurface drainage. Maybe you can address that compaction with some um, initial deep tillage and then, and then soil management after that. Um, once you determine that yes, you do want to, you want to in, um, install subsurface drainage, um, first recommendation would be to contact a drainage contractor and there, there certainly a, there are a few of them in the, in the region. Um, they're going to, some of the questions that will come up will be what are, what is the soil series? Um, what is the acreage? If you're a small farmer, um, they might not be willing to travel um, for a small job, but maybe you can pull together a few farmers in your area um, and make it worth their while to have a few um, jobs within a, within a particular um, um, area and so that they can move their equipment there cost effectively. Um, good to have a site visit. And then one of the big questions with Tal is always what is the spacing going to be and I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But before I do that, I want to, I want to um, briefly talk about the importance of, of soils and the soil texture and soil type. Um, certainly, um, whether a soil is a, is a clay or, or a sand um, would affect whether you get drainage at all and then what the spacing is. But we also have these, these really interesting soils in, in Vermont and New York um, that are Fragipan soils or soils with what they call a densic layer. And this is a layer of, of soil that is down anywhere between 18 to 30 inches. Um, and this layer prevents water movement, will severely limit water movement downward through it. 
Um, and this is an image of one. This is actually from Missouri, but this is a tragipan in, in Missouri. And you can see good root development above this, this densic layer, this tragipan. Um, and we have these soils in, in Vermont, Cabot soils, Peru soils, soils that are farmed um, and soils that often have some drainage issues because of this, this tragipan. And I bring this up because it's really important that um, if tiling a field like this, whether you've hired someone or whether you're doing some of this work yourself, that if the tile goes into the densic layer, um, it, water will not be able to access that, that tile line. You'll basically be putting it into this um, soil that, that is cementitious in a way and will prevent water from flowing into it. So just, just kind of a good, there's a few kind of um, um, things to consider around soil type and this is, this is one of them that the tile would need to go above this densic layer if you were placing it in these types of soils. So spacing, this is the, this is the question that um, drives a lot of the economics of tile. And how do we determine spacing of the laterals in a, in a tile system? Um, there is a Vermont drainage guide published by NRCS. This is a little out of date based upon current practice. Um, you can also calculate this based on the soil texture. Um, some contractors may or may not do that. Um, it, it can certainly be done by, by an engineer. Um, but then I, what I would recommend is just a usage of, of local knowledge, of talking to neighbors. Um, what, is, um, what has been success, successful in terms of spacing in your area on your soil type for the specific crops you're growing? Um, talking to the contractor can certainly um, give you some of that information, but also talking to your neighbors and those who have installed in your um, in installed locally. Personal financials certainly play into this. What degree of yield loss are you willing to um, willing to sustain? Um, you know, more the tighter the tile, the more ex the tighter the spacing, the more expensive um, the the wider the the spacing, the less expensive. Um, so you might want to um, balance your investment with your expected return. How long are you going to be on this land? Is it rented land? Um, you certainly, there are instances of tiling rented land. Uh, what's the value of the land? And then um, go through an economic analysis. And I have a, an example of one of those um, here in a, in a couple of slides. And just to, I'm showing an image here of correctly spaced tile drains. It's not really the depth of the water um, that matters for um, impact on crop impact on crops, it's really the speed at which the, the water is, is, is lowered. Um, so you don't want to install, install tiles so wide um, that the water is not lowered quick enough um, that it has a chance to um, cause stress to the, to the crop. And this is just showing correctly spaced drains and drains um, spaced too far, too far apart. And showing this dip in the above ground um, crop, which we've all seen seen in cornfields where we have tiles that are spaced too far apart. So the question often comes up, what about, like I said, depth, um, a question of how deep should tile be and how close should tile be um, placed together. These kind of go hand in hand. Um, the depth here on the left, the depth of the tile lines really Im primarily impact the amount of water that's going to be removed um, during the year because the tile or is always going to be wanting to drain the water down to the depth level with the tile. So the deeper the tile, the more water would be drained. Where on the other hand, a shallower tile, but with tighter spacing, will drain um, that water table down quicker. So it's really a matter of the amount of water and the speed of water um, as it leaves the soil. So here's a little more data. This is again from New York State from Larry Gehring and this is um, showing this concept of, of um, how we need, we, we try to hit a sweet spot with tile spacing um, and, and um, balance our, our level of investment to hit that, hit that sweet spot. So this sh shows a couple soils around back in a Swanton um, with net profit on the y-axis there and the drain spacing um, on the x-axis. And really um, here on the left with the blue and the red, um, the drains were, were spaced um, so tight that there wasn't enough, there wasn't profit um, um, experienced because the level of investment was so high. Um, but then you move the tile a little bit further apart and you hit this sweet spot 
we're getting um, good yield improvement, but the level of investment wasn't as high. Then as your tile gets spaced further and further apart, um, your profit drops because you're not seeing the yield improvement that you would with a closer spaced tile. Um, so I would say I would ignore the, this particular 100 foot, 200 foot particular x-axis scale because things are a little bit different now and it's different for every, every soil. And certainly we're seeing um, profit on tile that are spaced much closer than, than this, which would show the, the profit at 100 feet. So I just wanted to um, show the, this concept. So a few miscellaneous details of tile. Um, the, really the first step is to, in terms of moving forward toward an installation, is ensuring that you have an adequate outlet, um, that there's a, a, a place that water can drain freely outfall freely from the outlet of the of the tile line that if we back water up over top of an outlet um, we're going to then be backing water up into a field um, to the height of the water that's that's over top of the outlet um, so we just want to make sure we have a good outlet where we have free fall of water uh, tile is placed at least two and a half feet deep um, more typical would probably be three to three and a half feet now um, and, uh, and I've heard different reports from, from different areas of the state too. Pipe materials, um, you can get a double wall or a single wall pipe. A double wall pipe is smooth on the inside, which can be important for um, really flat um, fields uh, because we can put these at a little bit lower slope when they have a smooth interior. And this helps water move faster through that pipe um, and that means it's going to carry sediment with it and the sediment won't be deposited in the in the, those little corrugations and start to clog up the pipe. Uh, speaking of slope, at least a 0.2% grade um, would be a good rule of thumb. Um, the contractor is going to help you with, with all of this, um, but, but the contractor will help size the main pipe, uh, size the main. Um, that's a really important component. And then, good idea to put a rodent guard on all outlets. Um, you know, nothing will ruin your day more than, than spending thousands of dollars on, on drainage and then a groundhog crawls up into a 50 foot into a field and, and clogs your main. So um, it's worth a few extra bucks to make sure your rodent guards are, are functioning properly. And then a, a question of whether there needs to be a filter sock, and I'll show an image of one of those there. On your on your tile, um, contractors can help with this, but um, is important in some of the um, very fine uh, sands in the in the silty soils to keep those particles, those dispersive particles, from moving into the tile line and potentially clogging it. And then surface inlets; these are a really hot topic right now. Um, certainly, we think that some of the um, maybe some of the higher phosphorus loads from drainage systems are due to these surface inlets. Um, so I think, you know, we're going to learn more about this and see um, what some of the rules, if they change around surface inlets as we move forward. And I, I imagine Ryan will talk uh, more about that later on in, the, in this webinar series. So for installation of, of tile drainage, um, you know, it can be done a variety of different ways, depending, really depending on the size of the job. Um, you can do it with a backhoe on small jobs, um, a tile plow, highly recommended for the bigger jobs. This is just one example of a tile plow. They get much, much bigger um, than this. And they just really have a, it's like a subsoil, um, uh, like a subsoiler, except the shank um, feeds uh, the pipe underground as it, as it drags, um, as it's drug through the, through the soil. Uh, you can trench um, with a trenching machine. Um, this is this can be uh, um, a very costly way of installing tile. And really, I would only recommend this if there is some need for surface drainage to where you would need you would want to backfill um, with gravel or something more permeable than the than the surrounding soils. Uh, I would say timing does definitely matters for for tiling. Um, if you tile during a, when the soils are, are drier, you'll get more fracture, especially in the clays, you'll get more fracture of this, of those soils and you can help with internal drainage of those, of the soils. So if at all possible, 
how a drain when when soils will fracture when the tile plow is, is drug through them. There are really exciting technology that's being used right now for um, installing subsurface drainage, um, GPS, precision guided tractors and, and tile plows using RTK technology. Um, these can place tile at a sub inch accurate, you know, within a within an inch um, in order to maintain that grade line that you need for for proper positive drainage. Um, they're fast. They're great for big jobs and and large grade changes. And I think one of the one of the advantages of using um, a contractor with RTK is that they can then produce a map of the tile drainage um, that is fairly accurate, so that if you ever need to go back in and either repair that tile or add on to that tile, you have this have this fairly accurate map that you can refer to for locating it um, later on. Laser transit, you know, kind of good old fashioned surveying, um, um, good and, and effective, um, probably uh, mostly used for some of the smaller jobs and is definitely um, slower than, um, than the RTK that that's currently used, but but works. Should you do it yourself? Um, potentially for small jobs and random, you know, kind of these random depressional areas, you could certainly um, do this yourself with a backhoe and, and there are crews in, in Vermont um, that will do this for you. I would, I would recommend that for any job of any size, um, that a contractor will save you money in the long run and are, and are cheaper than a self-installation. Um, because of their experience, because of the reduced time it will take for them to um, install this, and because of you know their their design experience with with installing tile systems, um, and I would only consider doing large pattern systems yourself, um, buying your own equipment if local if contractors are not willing or able um, to serve you in your in your area because it can be fairly costly. So the economics of drainage. So should you invest in, in drainage? A really, uh, I think, important question. And it really uh, um, ties back to uh, what the yield improvement you would expect to see um, with that field after it's drained. So how do you determine what that yield improvement will be? Um, you can look at the NRCS soil specific optimum yield values that are in the soil survey. Um, other ways of doing this may be the look at a similarly managed well-drained soil um, and what the yield on that is, um, given your management style and your farm. And then what is the yield of, of the field that is of the problem field um, during an optimum weather year. So these are all good indicators of what the um, yield improvement could potentially be on that particular field. And don't, of course, don't forget that second benefit of drainage, which is the improved trafficability. Um, this plays a, a large hand in um, not just yield for that year, but um, uh, potential preventing potential soil damage and impacts on yield afterward with the compaction and the soil destruction that can occur if you're on a soil when you shouldn't be on a soil. And then ask yourself the questions of is drainage truly the yield limiter? and is drainage a problem on a regular basis. If it's only once every five to seven years, maybe this is not a good investment, um, but if it's a perennial problem, um, then, then drainage may be the way to go. And especially given some of the climate change information we've seen, um, that's, that's very possible. We'll see. Um, um, it will continue to be an issue in the future. Hey, Josh, it's yep. Heather. I'm yep. just checking on it, timing. We have about 15 minutes left, so. Okay. Don't okay. Know. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks. I will. I will wrap it up here in about five. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, just a quick example of economics of drainage. Um, so, I did this a, a couple of years ago. So, prices might not be necessarily um, current, um, but but pretty close. So, I took a fifty-acre field. Um, and a quote I had at the time was $900 an acre to tile this field. Uh, that's, a, that's probably closer to $1,200 an acre right now, depending on spacing. And in that field, we had 25 acres of corn on a poorly drained soil and 25 acres of corn on a moderately drained soil. 
So looking at the expected yield improvement, let's just go all the way over here to the right, two columns, the, the two columns furthest to the right. So we have an expected yield improvement of about four tons per acre on that poorly drained soil and an expected improvement of about a third a ton per acre on the moderately drained soil. Um, so if you look at the increased revenue, given these prices, again, these might be um, a little bit different now. This is a few years ago. Um, we could expect to see an annual um, uh, return on that investment of about $6,200. Um, and that's about $125 an acre for this $45,000 investment. So there are a couple ways to look at that. Um, you can do a simple payback period where you take your total investment cost um, divided by that annual return. So the payback on this would be about 7.2 years. I've heard farmers um, now are seeing maybe close to five year return period. Um, so pretty good um, payback period on this, on this investment. Um, different ways, uh, again, I'm going to kind of skip through this a little bit, but different ways of looking at the, uh, the wisdom of the investment um, with the internal rate of return and then the break-even analysis, meaning that um, if the yield improvement was less than 2.5 tons per acre, um, it would not be a smart investment. Um, but if it's greater than 2.5 tons per acre, it is a smart investment. And there are profitability analysis calculators out there, Prinsco, a drainage um, uh, company um, publishes one of these. It's on their website. I can send you a link if you're interested, um, but we'll produce all this information for you um, given your particular situation. A um, few additional considerations. How much drainage should you do at once? Um, I would recommend doing the worst first and then seeing how it works um, for you, um, but potentially having a contractor design everything all at once and save that um, cost um, if you think you're going to have them back to do more so you can bundle that design, those design services up, um, up front. And then how does this, how does drainage cost compare to cost of other strategies to improve your yield? Um, something you'll have to um, kind of um, considerations to think about. Okay, so I'm a, almost through here. I just wanna quickly mention some of the regulatory issues. I'm not going to talk through this, just other than to say USDA has rules about um, installing drainage on land, and the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers have laws about installing uh, um, drainage on land. If there's any question, if this is not prior drain land, um, please be in touch with the USDA before draining or clearing any wet areas, and they can help you make a determination of whether this is the, um, a safe move or not. There are definitely some environmental issues with drainage. Um, we're seeing this all over the country. Um, uh, of course, nutrient pollution of water bodies. Um, some of the unanswered questions, I think, in Vermont, which I think the other speakers will address, are what, are, what is the net um, balance of, um, of export of nutrients from the field when it's drained? So do we see a decrease in surface flow? I've certainly heard this anecdotally. I think it's unproven. Um, some of these questions just need more, we need more time to figure them out. And then um, preferential flow, which I'm gonna skip right through that um, and show this. So this is uh, just evidence of preferential flow, which are um, basically soil cracks or wormholes or root channels down through a soil that can transport water directly from the surface to a tile line. And this is where they've actually put a smoke machine into the end of a tile line and um, blew smoke into the tile and you can see it rising up through those preferential flow paths into a no-till cornfield. Um, so these are especially concerning but, um, in terms of transporting water and nutrients to tile lines. But I think our other speakers will talk more about that. And to finish, so if you're looking for um, a place for your summer vacation next summer, um, this is a, um, a Pretty exciting place, I guess, if you're a, an ag engineer or an ag enthusiast, the Mike Weaver Drain Tile Museum in upstate New York, in Geneva, New York, um, that uh, um, is where the first tile drainage was installed in the United States in the 1820s, and John Johnston um, improved his wheat yields from five bushels an acre to 50 bushels an acre um, after he imported tile from his homeland in Scotland. So. 
nice little roadside stop if you're ever over there. Okay, Heather, I think I'm finished. If there are any questions, um, please let me know. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Josh. That was great. I was very informative presentation. So um, right now, please, um, if you have questions, type them into the Q&A box or the chat box, whatever's easiest for you. Um, we are going to put up a quick poll that we would appreciate if you could answer. So Susan's going to launch that for us. It's just a couple of questions um, to see uh, what you've learned from Josh's presentation. <clears throat> And um, why people are filling that out, um, Josh, I'll start with the questions. There's a quick question about how much acreage in Vermont has drainage. Do we know that? I, I don't think we do know that, Heather. Um, um, I, think, I think that's a little unknown. I, um, and especially if you, it would be, it would be um, interesting to find out, but I think that there's a lot of land out there that has random drainage that was installed, you know, could be a hundred years ago again. Um, and I, I just think it's a big unknown. We, we just don't know how much is out there. Great. Um, another question is, um, was about uh, drainage spacing. Somebody was saying they were surprised to see that we do not use hydraulic conductivity to Ooh. determine drain spacing. Is there a specific reason for that? Sure, sure. So absolutely hydraulic conductivity would be used um, by the, the contractor doing the design through their design calculations. Um, I just did not get into those particular calculations, but hydraulic conductivity is a measure of how quickly water moves through a soil. So it's going to be much slower for a clay than it would be for a loam or a sand. And that would um, have a big impact on where that spacing, uh, the spacing of the tile um, would be. Um, it's important, but also um, I think the local knowledge and the experiences of neighbors and within the region is also a big factor in this, in, in especially in terms of the economics of the investment. So we, I, we should consider, we do, we should and we do consider both. Great. Um, do you have an example of potential yield gain in corn? Uh, what do you think a farmer could expect um, for yield gain in alfalfa? That's a that's a great question. And, you know, I searched high and low for data um, from Vermont. The best I could find was that from New York State, from from Larry Gehring. Um, I don't have any figures on that, and it would it would depend upon the soil. Um, it's itself and I, I would I would look to some of your neighbors and those who have who have tried who have installed tile to answer that question um, great well and I will um, in the last webinar I'll be sharing the results from our tile drainage survey that we conducted last winter and there's definitely some interesting results there at least um, documentation of um, complete crop failures out of five years, what people had experienced before they tile drained. Um, so very interesting information there that we'll share with folks. Um, okay, another question. Our family farm, it seems that the water table has gone up over the last 30 years or more. Will tile drainage help drain um, fields because of this? I, you know, I, I really, I see, a, that's happened on a lot of farms and I think it, it is a result of climate change. Um, it really depends on, it needs to be a site by site assessment. It, it's hard to just give a blanket statement that yes, tile is the right solution for you on your farm without seeing the farm um, and, and talking through some of the issues of where that water is coming from. Um, I think that that's where we have to start when we think about um, uh, installing tile. and and. UVM Extension, I'm, I'm glad to um, come out and, and talk through some of those issues with you. Great. Um, somebody had asked about if the webinars will be posted and as long as our presenters give us permission to do so, the video will be archived and made available um, on our website and we'll send out a note when, when it's available. It takes a little bit to, to get it ready to post. 
Um, another question, what kind of costs could be expected to get um, a design and field evaluation done to see if um, tiling makes sense? Um, so in terms of the cost figures that I'm familiar with involve involve the design and the installation. Um, and that's, you know, between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars an acre, roughly what what I hear for pattern systems at a 20, oh, 25 to 35 foot foot spacing. In terms of just the design services, you would need to contact a, a contractor. And I, I have a list of contractors um, that I can share with anyone if they'd like to reach out to me. I don't necessarily promote any particular one, but I can share you with a list I've com a list I've compiled over the past few years. Great. Um, well, it looks like we're just about out of time. We have two more minutes. Uh, any more questions folks have, please type those in as soon as possible. Um, I want to apologize about our a technical difficulty that we had with the Zoom system this morning. So sorry for a few folks that weren't able to get in right away. I'm not sure what was going on. Um, but again, the video uh, will be archived and posted so people can go back and listen to the entire presentation if you missed a little bit. Josh, is there anything else um, you want to, to add before we say goodbye to everyone this morning? No, um, I appreciate your time. And, and like I said, um, please, if there are specific questions on your farm, reach out to Extension and we'll, we'll try to um, um, provide some assistance. All right. Well, thanks everyone. And hopefully we'll see you on or hear you see your emails <laughs> on Friday. Um, Matt Rourke from the University of Wisconsin will be our guest speaker on Friday. So Josh, thank you very much. And everyone have a great rest of the day. Thanks. Thanks.